Hello, God bless you. Welcome to our daily video where we take a daily look at a Bible verse. It's like just like when we get hungry and we feed our physical bodies, we also need to feed our spiritual bodies. We feed our spiritual bodies with the bread of life, which is the Bible. Reading the Bible, getting along with God, spending time with Him, seeking Him in prayer, and reading the Bible. You can read a physical Bible, free Bible app, or one of the various websites. But it's so important to us in this day and age as we see. Deception everywhere is so important to read the Bible for yourself, to know what the Word has to say. Because as we see the approaching, the end coming, you will know the end when you know the Word. Because that's where we find out about the end, it's in the Word of God. We give you an appetizer, a verse of the day, with some discussion. It hopes that you will open your Bible. You complete the meal, you will feast on this bread of life. That you will complete the stories. We're going to be in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 9. Follow along in your Bibles or follow along on the screen. Ezekiel, chapter 9, verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. This is such a beautiful passage and I'm going to show you why and I pray that you get something out of it like I have in my daily studies i seen something in this verse that I hadn't seen before and it really blessed me and I kind of pondered on it and was thinking about it but then I got a confirmation someone else had done a video and they mentioned it and it just really added to what I saw and I just want to share it today so if you go to somewhere where you can see you know the definitions of these words in Hebrew say Bible Gateway you go to Bible or Bible Hub or excuse me you go to Bible Hub and you you look at the Strong's King James and you go to chapter 9 verse 4 and you click on the word Mark you'll see this Mark is number 8420. It means Tal. That's the Hebrew word for Mark. You see that that's the definition is that it's a Mark. Tal is a very beautiful thing. It, and we'll kind of explain why, but we won't go into great detail. But this next slide right here shows what Tob looks like throughout the ages, the earliest version, the next version after that, and then the next version. So you see at first it kind of looks like a T, kind of, right? Then it kind of looks like an X. Then it kind of looks like an N, and then an N again. Here's another slide with the same thing, but it gives a little bit more of a detailed definition. Here you see the word Tav. Look at what it says for the pictograph. Crossed sticks. It says the meaning is a mark, sign, signal, or monument. I believe that says. This is what the modern Tav looks like. And Tal, just so you know, is the last letter in the alphabet, in the Hebrew alphabet. Much like in Amer you know, in America, in our alphabet, our last letter is Z. This is the Z of the Hebrew alphabet, Tal.
this is what it looks like in the ancient pits giraffe. Remember it said cross sticks. Does that look familiar to you? How about now? Now you see, we're not going to go into it because that's, we're in Ezekiel. But tile has a special meaning in connection with Jesus. And all I'll say for now is read Revelation 8, 1 8, excuse me. Study what Alpha and Omega mean. And then realize that Jesus was a Jew. He was talking to John, who was a Jew. But, what it says here, in this scripture, God is saying to Ezekiel, And the Lord said unto him, Ezekiel, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark, a cross, upon the foreheads of the men that sigh, and that cry for all the abominations and that be done in the midst thereof. You see, I think this is so beautiful. You know, I've, I've heard some people who like to pick out certain things that the church has adopted, you know, through the years. Certain things that maybe was a part of a pagan worship or whatever it may be and they think that churches shouldn't you know have a part of this you know some people talk about the steeple you know and, and other people talk about the cross they say the cross is a symbol of a star that was worshipped and maybe it was there's people smarter than me that have looked that stuff up and you could do your own research and search that out. But what we do know is what I believe that the Hebrew is God's language. And like I said, if you look at what Jesus said in Revelation 1 8, and you look at the Hebrew and you look at the picture version of it, and maybe you know what I'm talking about, maybe you don't. So look at the first Hebrew letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the last letter. We just looked at the last letter. Cross sticks. It's a picture of the, of the redemption. From John chapter 1 verse 29. John the Baptist sees Jesus coming to get baptized. He says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. We see that in the Hebrew alphabet. Do your own research, look it up. But I find it so interesting, you know, because nowadays you may go into a church and maybe they do it with water, maybe they do it with olive oil, maybe they do it with some type of other oil. You'll, see, you'll typically see people, they'll put a cross on someone's head when they're praying for them. So long before, because according to the research that I, you know, that I shared from our video on Sunday, from Ezekiel 44 verse 2, but Ezekiel was born, was, you know, alive about 600 years before Jesus. So 600 years before Jesus, God is saying, put a, the shape of a cross on people's foreheads. I find that so beautiful, so interesting. I think that's a, so amazing that he is saying set a tav upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry so the mark of the cross is being put on the foreheads of these people long before the sacrifice that Jesus put on the cross and these pictures 
pictograph versions of the Tav were long before Jesus came to this earth. See, God knows what he's doing. Nothing, nothing takes him by surprise. He, you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, he didn't go, well, what do we want to do? We got, we got to come up with a plan to, plan B. He knew from the beginning. And as we see in Revelation 13, 8, there was this lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He knew how all this is going to play out. He knew all the sins that you were going to do before you done them. And praise God for all of us who have come to the same knowledge of Jesus Christ. That God is, was loving enough to allow us to come to have this relationship with Him. And praise God that He tarried long enough that we could come to our senses and realize that we can't do this on our own. That we need a Savior. You know, I've told my story several times. 13 saved and baptized. But for 20 years I lived how I wanted to live doing what I wanted to do. And God loved me and all of you enough that he did not come and sound that trumpet when I was living for myself doing what I wanted to do. And maybe there's someone listening right now that that's what, they're, what you're doing. You say you love Jesus, but you don't have him in your heart. The door is closing. One day that trumpet will sound. You want to be with Jesus. You don't want to be here. Sadly, there will be people that will be here. But if you're on the fence right now, you've got one foot in the world and one foot with Jesus, Take your foot off. Hop off the fence and either get in, get in the world or get with Jesus. You can't straddle the fence. Because one day that trumpet's going to sound and you're going to fall off the fence. Because you can't be with one foot in the world and one foot in Jesus. I pray you make the decision today. That you don't wait another day. Because we don't have much time. Well, I pray this message blessed you. God loves you so much. You are not alive by accident. You were created for a purpose. God did not create you just to fill the earth with people, just to take up space. And much like any good parent, God only wants the best for you. God has a plan for you. When God formed you in your mother's womb, God had a plan for your life. You know, we all have this void in our life. Some call it God-shaped hole. A missing puzzle piece. You try to fill it with everything that the world has to offer. Sex, drugs, alcohol, money, friendship, power, popularity, houses, cars, money. But nothing can fill that void. Only God. That's why they call it a God-shaped hole. That void is there because we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. There's none of us that are righteous, not one. That void, that sin is there because we live in a fallen world. Jesus is coming back to set up his earthly kingdom. And the requirement to enter this kingdom is that we must be absolutely perfect and without sin. But no one is without sin. We all mess up. We all miss the mark. We all sin. Sin means to break God's rules, neither thoughts or actions. We see here in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is perfect. No one, not one. We see that in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. That's echoed in Ecclesiastes 7.20. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10 say, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In verse 10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So we're deceiving ourselves and calling God a liar if we say that we're perfect and don't sin. And there's a punishment for our sin. We see that in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
We all face eternal judgment and separation from God. This is why we must receive Jesus into our life as Lord, and believing what Jesus did is the greatest gift that we'll ever receive. It's a free gift of God of, of eternal life, not about works. No one can be saved by their own works. You cannot be a good enough person. We see here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Galatians 2, 16, Knowing that the man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We will never live long enough to even begin to pay for our salvation. Here's a word picture for you. If you don't accept Jesus' free gift, his get out of jail free card, and you stay in that spiritual jail cell, and the jailer opens the door and says that you're free to go, someone paid your bail, but you're relying on your works, thinking you could be a good enough person, so you stay in that cell thinking that you can get your own way to heaven, that you doubt that there's only one way, that you think you can find your own way, saying, no, I'm good. I'm a good person. God wouldn't send me to hell. I can get myself out of here. But you can never be good enough. So don't deny this free get out of jail ticket. You can still escape this spiritual jail cell. Because as you see, sin separates us from God. Not only does sin separate us from God, it's a valley gets deeper and wider with each sin. And that sin valley gets wider and deeper with every sin. So it separates us from God and man. You see how man is further from God now. Now the only way to atone for that sin and for God to fill that void in your life is by the shedding of blood. See it there, Hebrews 9:22. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. You see in the Old Testament, they would use the blood of an animal sacrifice. The animal sacrifice was a temporary bridge to God. Once they sinned again, they would have to offer another animal. Because as they sinned, that valley would get deeper and wider. And see, what, look at what happens. It causes the bridge to collapse. God knows that we can never be good enough. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. Jesus is the only one who lived a perfect life and became the substitute for our sins. Jesus always existed. Jesus is God. Jesus left his throne in heaven. He became flesh. He wasn't an angel. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a prophet. He was flesh and blood and bone, fully God and fully man. He lived a perfect, sinless life. Jesus came to the earth to die for all of us. Jesus was crucified on a cross, died a brutal death, was buried in a tomb. He was in that tomb for three days and three nights, and then he rose from the dead proving that he is God because death and the grave had no power over him. Jesus took our place, suffered God's wrath for us, the punishment that we all deserve. We've seen the wages of sin is death. We're guilty for our sins. We deserve the punishment. But the punishment was poured out on Jesus. God gave his son to the world to die in our place. Jesus paid God's price for our sins when he died on the cross. And our sins were nailed to the cross. Jesus nailed our sins to the cross with him. Jesus shed his precious blood for our sins. And Jesus' blood covered those sins so that we don't have to die. Jesus was sinless. He was an innocent of death. And like any innocent man wrongfully arrested, Jesus died for us because of our sin, because we're guilty. We deserve God's wrath. The wages of sin is death. But Jesus loves us enough to die for us. Jesus is truly the only way to the Father. There you see John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Because Jesus was perfect and never sinned, he was the only one worthy to pay the price for our sins. And just like the animal sacrifice had to be completely perfect with no spot, no blemish, no defect. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Paid our debt. We're free to go. Jesus paid our debt in full when he died on the cross. He purchased us, redeemed us, brought us back to him, purchased us with his blood, shed on the cross for us. Jesus paid for our sins long before we ever committed them. We see that in Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love towards us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So long before we were ever born, Jesus paid the price for our sin in full. So don't wait until you overcome an addiction to your financially secure Go to God now. He will help you through anything and everything that you're going through. The gospel can be summed up in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him 
might be saved. He didn't come to condemn you. He, he came and loved you. He knew that you couldn't be good enough, that you couldn't be perfect. So he came and died for you. Then Jesus ascended to the Father, ascended up to heaven. We're much like a courtroom. God the Father is the judge. Jesus, the Son of God, is our defense attorney. We see this in Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Also, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And Satan is the prosecutor. We see that in Revelation 12, 10. More so the last part where it says, the Satan's the accuser of the brethren, which accuses us before God day and night. So it's like a courtroom. The prosecutor tells God all our sins. As you see here, it says, see what they did? They're guilty. But Jesus, our defense attorney, says, our sins are stricken from the record. Our sins are forgiven. Jesus paid the fine with his blood on the cross. You see it, those sins are stricken from the record. I paid those sins in full. Your salvation is a free gift from God. So receive this free gift that Jesus gave you long before you were born. You know, Jesus wants to save us from the penalties of our sins and give us eternal life. But we must first individually receive him. We see in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Acts 3, 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And just like works, don't get us into heaven. Neither does just knowing who Jesus is. You have to have Jesus in your heart, have a relationship with him. There's a big difference between knowing Jesus intellectually. Like you see there, what the guy has got in his mind, he knows about Jesus being on the cross. But there's a big difference between knowing him intellectually and having a relationship. So you see you got the one guy, he's got thinking about Jesus on the cross. This other one has Jesus in his heart. And they're hugging. So he's got a relationship with him. When you believe with Jesus in your heart, you talk to him in prayer. You read his word, the Bible. You put Jesus first before your family, before your job, before your money, whatever it may be. I like to think of it this way. Our sin put us in a jail, in a spiritual jail. So, where we await our trial. Then suddenly the door opens. The jailer says that we're free to go. Someone paid our bail. That was Jesus. Jesus paid our bail. But we're running out of time. Jesus is really coming back soon. So we need to repent. Come back to God while you still can. Repent means to turn away, to change your mind, to do a 180, make a U-turn, change your behavior. It's that simple. It's ABC simple, in fact. Ask for admit you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Admit you can't do this on your own. Admit that you need Jesus. Ask for believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he was. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. Believe that Jesus paid the price for your sins. Believe that Jesus did it all for you. See his call or confess. Call on the name of the Lord. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Confess that Jesus is Lord. Confess and repent of your sins. Talk to God. Prayer is a conversation with God. And since he's present everywhere, you can speak aloud. Talk in your head. He will hear you. On the screen is a sample prayer you can say. Or you can use your own words. Just as long as it's from your heart. That's what we've seen in Romans 10, 9 and 10. you got to believe in your heart. you got to really mean the words. And when you do, you'll be saved. But it's not about the prayer. It's about making that realization that you can't do this on your own. Prayers, ABCs of salvation, that's just a tool, but it's not what saves you. What saves you is having a complete repentance to changing your attitude and wanting to seek God, wanting to have a relationship with Him. And repentance, you know, it's, it's changing your attitude. I mean, I give this example that if I keep doing wrong to you and keep apologizing, but don't change my behavior, it's not going to mean anything. You're not going to accept my apology after a while. But if I if I say I'm sorry and I change my behavior and I don't treat you like that anymore, then you can even, you can forgive me easier. That's what repentance is: is changing your mind. You know, you're you're changing your attitude. You're not you're not doing repeating the same thing. I mean, we're all gonna mess up, but it's the 
I'm sorry, but I'm not going to change my behavior. We have to change the behavior. We're saved through faith in Jesus. It's a free gift from God, 100% free. Don't think that you've got to be good enough to earn it somehow because you can't. Just repent and believe in Jesus. Then you'll be saved. But you must have a personal relationship with Jesus. Go to God first, not last. Wherever you are, God is with you. God created you for a reason. When you accept Jesus' free gift and invite Jesus in your life, then God gives you a new heart and begins to mold you into who he created you to be. God is continually molding us because even though we are saved, we will still sin because we're unfinished. God is working on us. It's like these Legos. I figure this is kind of the best explanation I can do. You see this Lego, it's just, dump, it's just a pile, right? It's like when you dump a, dump a box of Legos on a table. You're going to get a pile like this. It's not going to look like a house until you start snapping those bricks together. That's what God's doing. He's continually, just like snapping these bricks together, He's continually molding us into who He created us to be. It's not just a dump them out on the table and it's a house. No, it's a pile like that. That's a, just a pile of mess. It, now we got to snap the bricks together to make the house. That's what God's doing with us. But read the Bible for yourself, because with all the deception in the world, the Bible is the only truth in the world. You need to know what the Bible says for yourself, because Jesus' return is imminent. He's coming soon. We see all the signs that Jesus talked about happening worldwide. Banks failing, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in diverse places, famines, pestilence. So don't wait, don't put Jesus off. Give your life to Jesus today while you still have the opportunity. Jesus paid the price for you as a free ticket waiting for you to enter into heaven. And all you have to do is take the opportunity today, turn to Jesus, and accept that free gift. And do it before it's too late. You don't have time to wait. Tomorrow might be a one day too late. I love you. Jesus loves you. I can't wait to see what the Lord has for us tomorrow. See you tomorrow, God willing. Or maybe we'll see you in the clouds. Have a great day.